to rulers who chose dictatorship as their vector of development have existed in the same historical space for quite a long time. They couldn't help but notice each other's figures on the world stage, as both were too self-centered. Hitler and Stalin, whether they knew each other and what they said about each other before and during the war. Today it cannot but surprise, but mutual approval of each other could be traced both to Stalin and Hitler long before the outbreak of the war. The purge of the Red Army, initiated by Stalin, which began in the 30s, went on in waves. Despite the fact that the military repressions of these years are usually associated with the Tukhachevsky case, the repressions began much earlier. After all, there is a fairly widespread opinion that all Kedris in the Red Army are representatives of the working class and the peasantry. However, this was too far from the truth. Almost half of the command staff were representatives of the Imperial Army. They voluntarily served with the Reds but aroused suspicion. In 1934, Hitler did the same thing when he removed his former party member and colleague Rome from the leadership of the assault detachments. It was at that time that Stalin allegedly noted Hitler's determination, noting that this was exactly what should be done with opponents, including political ones. During the signing of the molotov ribbentrop Pact in the 39th year, Stalin even raised a toasts, one of which was dedicated to Hitler, whom the Secretary General called the great leader of his people. He also drank to the welfare of Himmler, who, according to him, acted as the guarantor of German order. However, it is safe to say that both the toasts and all of Stalin's words were rather ordinary politeness and were conditioned by the place and circumstances. Hitler is also credited with many phrases about Stalin, which often contain a positive assessment. For example, at the beginning of the 41st year, during a working meeting with his senior military leadership, he noticed that Stalin was an intelligent man, a real master of his country. At the same time, he often expressed value judgments about the leaders of other states, often unflattering. For example, he talked about Churchill in the context of his addiction to alcohol, and Roosevelt generally considered it inadequate. Moreover, after the Führer's army galloped across Europe, and only the Soviet Union fiercely resisted, Hitler called Stalin a genius. Given that Stalin was older than Hitler and had been in power longer, it is not surprising that the Fuhrer showed genuine interest in both the personality of the general secretary and his policies. Borrowings often occur. Until a certain time, Hitler, in fact, was generous in his assessment of Stalin's activities. Apparently, realizing that he was faced with an equal, then he did not understand that he was superior to him, opponent. The name of Stalin from Hitler's mouth sounded in the context of the fact that the German army is faced with the task of splitting the Russian people so that people of Stalin's scale no longer appear. They say that so far this is the only world politician who deserves respect. Stalin is credited with a truly legendary phrase in its rightness. At the end of the 41st year, when Hitler's troops were already near Moscow, the Secretary General had a conversation with the British Foreign Secretary. Then Stalin called Hitler a genius, they say, at least for the fact that in such a short time he was able to create a powerful state worthy of respect. But at the same time, Stalin noticed that he had one drawback that would be fatal. He did not understand when to stop. Considering what events were taking place at that moment on the world stage, and the fact that it was at that moment that Hitler's troops were conquering more and more Soviet territories, one can only envy Stalin's confidence and endurance. After all, in the end he managed to prove the truth of his words. After the start of the war, of course, the statements of the two rulers to each other could not be in a positive way. They noticed each other's shortcomings and mistakes more often. For example, Hitler noted that Stalin was still a brilliant business executive and that his plans for the development of the country's economy were so impressive that only their own plans for four years could surpass them. When hostilities turned in the opposite direction, Hitler began to call Stalin Genghis Khan. But Stalin was silent. Having expelled the occupiers from his own country, he proved this not by word, but by deed. And even after the war, until his death, he never allowed himself to mention Hitler's name. What for? In the end, everything was clear enough. It is safe to say that when discussing the opposite side, Stalin showed himself to be a much more restrained person. The writer Konstantin Simonov, communicating with Marshal Zhukov, learned that on the eve of the war, the rulers exchanged letters. However, official documents on this issue are still classified. But allegedly in the middle of May of the 41st year, a German plane delivered a letter to Moscow. Moreover, the arrival was not coordinated in any way. But, nevertheless, the plane somehow managed to get to the very capital of the USR. 
So, in that letter, Hitler wrote that he gives his word of honor that this is not true. We are talking about rumors about an impending attack on the U.S. -er. The Führer's honors lasted exactly five weeks. That's how long the war lasted. By this time, troops were already concentrated at Soviet borders. But Hitler allegedly assured in a letter that by mid-June their transfer to the West for military operations with England would begin. At the same time, the Führer expresses fears that there may be provocations on the part of his generals, who, in order to save England from imminent collapse, decide to start a war with the country of the Soviets by provocative methods, and he ends his letter with an offer to meet with him in July of the same year. Hitler absolutely did not recognize military intelligence as something worthwhile, and he also treated political diplomacy. He did not believe that rapid and effective mobilization was possible in the USSR. At the same time, Stalin, in response to Zhukov's demands to begin mobilization, threw Hitler's letter at him as the strongest argument. He could not imagine that the words of the leader of the state could be so empty. When Hitler gathered at the top of the Wehrmacht in the Reich Chancellery on June 14th to discuss the attack on the USSR, he invited everyone to express their point of view, but absolutely everyone supported the Führer's decision. At the same time, many later wrote in their memoirs that they had many doubts and arguments against them, but they remained silent. Hitler stressed that there is a struggle between the two ideologies and that the previous practice of warfare will not work. He urged him to be as tough and frightening as possible, to arrange a real terror. None of those present objected. On the 20th of June, the Soviet ambassador to Germany informed Beria that there would be a war. Beria was skeptical about this, although he informed Stalin. Despite all the warnings, Stalin did not expect that the war would begin so soon. All the forces that were concentrated in the west of the country looked like an improvisation. However, the lightning capture plan did not involve the presence of large reserves. Saturday, the 21st of June, turned out to be very hot both in Moscow and in Berlin. People were resting by the reservoirs with their families. Meanwhile, German troops were pulling up forces. The top of the Politburo practically did not part that day. After receiving new reports from military intelligence, they gathered again and again. Not so long ago, the first president of Ukraine reported from television screens that Stalin and Hitler met in the 39th year in Lviv. However, there are no documents confirming the meeting of the two heads of state. In addition, Stalin could not physically be in Lviv on the 17th of October of the 39th year. It's no secret that only Vyacheslav Molotov met with Hitler in the 40th year. On October 16th, Stalin finished his working day at 9 o'clock in the evening. He had a meeting with the same Molotov, and on the morning of October 17th, he still communicated with the People's Commissar on working moments. And anyway, why would Stalin and Hitler secretly meet in the 39th year? Such meetings can only be conditioned by extreme necessity. At that time, this definitely did not exist. In September, an agreement on friendship and border was signed between the two countries, which determined the friendly order of relations. Later, Hitler would try to convince the U.S. to take joint action against Great Britain. Consequently, there is no evidence and argument in favor of the fact that the meeting of Stalin and Hitler took place in the 39th year or ever before.